Does it seem way too complicated? Does it seem crazy? Are these dosages way too high? Voice your opinion in the comment section. Moving on to the peptides. After one year without exogenous growth hormone, I'm going to add it back in. Starting with 1.2, I use Nordytropin before bed. And the reason why I'm doing it before bed and not before the workout or before fasted cardio in the morning is because I don't want to get sleepy. Again, exogenous growth hormone makes me a little bit tired and lethargic and sleepy right after dosing. So I don't want to reintroduce this to the point it's going to lower my productivity. I'm going to start with 1.2 IU Nordytropin GH before bed. And my bedtime is about four o'clock in the morning. So I'll probably administer that at three o'clock in the morning. Again, my circadian rhythm right now is kind of messed up. So I'm not counting on any endogenous growth hormone secretion, even though my growth hormone levels are pretty much in the middle of the reference range whenever I test them with a blood work checkup. So I will be dosing the growth hormone initially around three o'clock in the morning, one hour before going to bed, starting with 1.2 IUs. The reason why it's 1.2 IUs is because every click on a Nordytropin pen is 0.4 IUs. So I'll do three clicks, 1.2 IUs. And then depending on the amount of water retention that I'll get from that or how sleepy I get, during the day, I might bump up the dose after two or three weeks on 1.2 IUs Nordytropin per day before bed to two or 2.4 IUs per day before bed. And if I respond well to that, I don't get so much water retention. I'm not too lethargic. I might move this single dose of Nordytropin to pre-workout so I can deal with a little bit of the lipolysis during the workout and burn off some of the body fat that is being released and mitigate some of the insulin resistance, which happens acutely. Again, dosing growth hormone before the workout improves fat loss, and of course increases the overall anabolic response that you get from the single dose of growth hormone, because now growth hormone levels are going to be highest right after the workout has completed. After which IGF-1 production increases within the liver, improving nutrient partitioning with all of the meals eaten post-workout. Now, I don't expect too much IGF-1 production because my IGF-1 levels haven't been phenomenally high on any dose of exogenous growth hormone. Right now, my serum IGF-1 levels are around 180 nanograms per milliliter, and I'll be lucky if I get 250 nanograms per milliliter out of a single dose of 2.4 IUs growth hormone. Again, much higher than that, I'm not really expecting. I will be adding in long-acting insulin in the form of Lantus, at five to 10 IUs upon waking in a single dose. I'm not going to do a double dose of Lantus because I'll be in a caloric deficit. And I just want a little bit of increased nutrient partitioning on top of the elevated IGF-1 levels, which I hopefully will get from this single dose of growth hormone before bed or before the workout. So besides increased IGF-1 levels, I'll be increasing my basal insulin levels throughout the day as well five units to 10 units upon waking. That's the maximum dose I'm going to take. Previously in the past, I've gone as high as 35 IUs of Lantus upon waking or 25 units Lantus in the morning and then 10, sometimes even 12 IUs Lantus before bed. Again, those were the days where I was 118 kilos in the off season. Those days are long behind me. So I'm going to keep the insulin dose moderate, five to 10 IUs upon waking to improve nutrient partitioning to help dispose of the gluconeogenesis, which is going to occur when following a ketogenic diet. Again, if I'm going to follow a fat loss phase with about 2,500 calories or maybe 2,800 calories, again, right now I'm eating 3,200, but I'm going to lower that slowly over time. There will be a little bit of gluconeogenesis from this increased lipolysis that is going to take place. The glycerol backbone, which stores three triglyceride molecules within adipose tissue, once released, this glycerol backbone will convert into glucose through gluconeogenesis within the liver, raising serum glucose concentrations. And if you take a low amount of basal insulin, Lantus, you keep your serum glucose concentrations within range, promoting further lipolysis. There's no negative feedback of serum glucose for further lipolysis from adipose tissue. So you're basically creating a one-way street by using a storage hormone in the form of insulin from your adipose tissue to your skeletal muscle. And when you follow a ketogenic diet, which restricts carbohydrates, your skeletal muscle are always glycogen depleted. So a low dose of basal insulin will go a very long way 
it's not enough to make you hypoglycemic. I've done this protocol a hundred, well, not a hundred times, but many times before, and I've never been at any point in time hypoglycemic. All of the gluconeogenesis, which comes from adipose tissue, will be stored in skeletal muscle, and all of the gluconeogenesis that comes from the protein that you're eating is also stored in skeletal muscle and a little bit of cardio or standing desk or walking in between sets or doing the actual act of bodybuilding in the gym training for hypertrophy will be more than enough to keep yourself glycogen depleted. So this is very beneficial during a fat loss phase because again, you're actively promoting the storage of glucose, keeping skeletal muscle somewhat full on a ketogenic diet, but not so full to the point that you're losing insulin sensitivity. So by using insulin, a storage hormone, you're actually losing fat more efficiently. And this is the reason why I added in five to 10 IUs of basal insulin upon waking. I'll also be using Humalog, which is a fast acting insulin, which I'll only use on leg day. On leg day, I will have a very complicated pre-workout cocktail, which contains high brand cyclic dextrin, uh, essential amino acids, dextrose, quinine, man, I'll, I'll make a separate video about that. A quad day and a hamstring day for me is not going to be a catabolic event. Again, my quads and hamstrings are a little bit lagging. I'm trying to bring them up. So with proper intra-workout nutrition, even though I'm in a cro chronic caloric deficit for the rest of the week, during my quad and hamstring days, I'll be in a caloric surplus and I'll use maybe three to five IUs fast-acting insulin pre-workout about an hour before to help shuttle these nutrients in. So instead of depleting my skeletal muscle during these strenuous workouts, I'm constantly topping off the amount of energy and nutrients that I'm losing while training insane. Now, again, time will tell how efficient this protocol is going to be because I haven't used pre-workout insulin in about two years or so. So I'm going to have to make some adjustments here and there, depending on how many carbohydrates and essential amino acids I'm actually going to take in pre-workout and intra-workouts. So stay tuned for that finalized protocol. It might still take a couple of weeks before I release that. For now, I'm just going to say three to five IUs of Humalog pre-workout on quad and hamstring day with a pretty extensive pre-workout and intra-workout nutritional plan. Now that covers pretty much the anabolic peptides. Again, I won't be adding in IGF-1 because I'm relying on a little bit of norditropin to increase IGF-1 production in the liver. It seems that long-acting insulin, Lantus, has been associated with increased IGF-1 levels as well. So I'm relying on this synergy between both of these compounds. And depending on the contributing beneficial effects and the potential side effects, the lethargy, the sleepiness, the water retention, the potential for hypoglycemia, even though I'm pretty good with my serum glucose levels because I do have a glucometer at home and I check my serum glucose levels pretty frequently. I have extensive experience with insulin. That's why I wrote an insulin ebook. I'm the only person who ever attempted it. You can find it on my website, direct link down below. So this basically covers the growth hormone receptor pathway for anabolism and hyperplasia and anti-aging and all of the other benefits associated with moderately elevated growth hormone levels. I'll be cutting my fingernails and trimming my hair more often than before, I'm sure of it. This covers the insulin receptor pathway, increasing overall nutrient partitioning and storage of nutrients. And this also covers the insulin-like growth factor one receptor pathway, which also improves nutrient partitioning, storage facilitates hyperplasia. Of course, this also facilitates aging. So I'm not going to be taking IGF-1 directly, I'm just relying on IGF-1 production within the liver. Besides these peptides, I'm going to continue to use MOTS-C, which is a mitochondrial peptide. Again, MOTS-C is not a peptide that the human body uses, but it's used by the mitochondria to increase ATP synthesis. So what I've noticed by taking five milligrams MOTS-C on Monday and Friday is that my overall energy levels have improved. I still want to do a separate video about MOTC and how much of a benefit it could offer for people that are a little bit older, have a demanding job, still want to go to the gym, have a very active lifestyle, constantly working from the morning until the late hours. I feel that MOTC is highly beneficial if you have a very demanding lifestyle, in which case you're, you'll be supplied with a ton of energy. So that's what I've noticed from the MOTC. I'm going to continue to run that, even though on my previous blood work results, what the scientific literature would tell you is that MOTC will improve hemoglobin A1C levels, 
improve fasting insulin levels, improve fasting glucose levels, none of which I experienced. And even though the peptide is quite expensive, um, the benefits that I get out of it, the increased energy levels and the increased focus that I get from Mod C as a peptide um, warrant its use. So I will continue to use that throughout the duration of my cycle. The only thing that I've really noticed is that my body temperature has increased, which indicates that my mitochondria are working a little bit more efficiently and producing more ATP by adding this peptide to my protocol, five milligrams on Monday and five milligrams on Friday. Yes, I've experimented with five milligrams of Mod C every day. Don't do what I did. That's way too much. That's way too much energy. And I literally felt that my body started to radiate heat outwards. Not very comfortable in this heat. It is Thailand. And also not very comfortable if you're a little bit higher body fat levels, which unfortunately, as of now, I still am. 15%, 17%. So five milligrams Mod C Monday, Friday is more than enough to get all of the benefits and none of this heat increasing side effects. I'll continue with my IV treatment. As a quick reminder that 1800 milligrams injectable glutathione, 5000 milligrams injectable vitamin C, a B100 complex, that's once per week on Wednesday. So I have the Mod C Monday, Friday, and then in the middle of the week, I do my IV treatment. I'll add in NAD plus 250 milligrams once per month. I've done a loading phase of about five to six weeks of weekly NAD plus administrations, 250 milligrams every single time I would do an IV treatment. But now that I feel that my NAD plus stores have saturated, I'm only going to do it once a month. I've switched to 250 milligrams NMN, which is a building block for NAD plus. So just like N-acetylcysteine is a building block for glutathione, Nicotinamide mononucleotide is a building block for nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. So I take all four. I've continued to take N acetylcysteine at 2000 milligrams per day, even while taking the injectable glutathione, because I do feel that NAC by itself has some additional benefits for liver health because you're taking it through the oral route. Now, I'm not exactly sure if NMN has additional benefits besides taking NAD intravenously but it's certainly a lot cheaper and i want to see if i can maintain this feeling by switching to 250 milligrams nmn per day and i might increase that to 250 milligrams nmn twice per day morning and evening later on if i don't notice so much of an energy boosting effect that i would get from weekly nad plus administrations for better lack of the word i feel charged kind of like the duracell bunny i feel charged all day and energetic without feeling stimulated. So that is, for me, a very positive effect. I feel that my sleep quality has improved. I feel that my overall energy levels have improved more beyond what the Mod C offered me. I felt that the Mod C is, I know it's purely anecdotal, but let's say 25% increase in my energy levels. And the NAD+, Plus, even now that I haven't taken it for a few weeks, because I only take a single dose once per month, I feel that the NAD plus increased my overall energy levels by 75% more. So if I doubled my energy levels, 25% came from the Mod C and 75% came from the NAD plus. Hopefully 250 to 500 milligrams NMN is able to sustain that and maybe even improve upon it. I will continue with the monthly NAD plus administrations, 250 milligrams once per month. And then I will add in 250 milligrams NMN, maybe once or twice per day to see if it offers additional benefits. I will keep the modafinil in, uh, talking about charged and feeling energetic, 50 milligrams modafinil per day. I've been running that upon waking for well, way longer than I'm willing to admit, but it's been years and I don't want to remove this compound from my performance enhancing drug selection. I feel that it's contributing to my overall productivity Due to its dopaminergic and serotonergic acted actions, I feel that my mood is increased and it's just something I'm not willing to let go. So the 50 milligrams modafinil will stay into my protocol as a staple purely to improve my productivity and help with my mood throughout the entirety of the day. I will add in clenbuterol 20 micrograms upon waking to facilitate additional anabolism through the beta-2 adrenergic receptors to maybe help mitigate and alleviate some of the symptoms which I'm still experiencing 
from the fluorona, feel a little bit shortness of breath, a little bit of constricting within my lungs. Now, as we all know, clenbuterol is a very potent bronchodilator, so I'm hoping that 20 micrograms clenbuterol per day will be sufficient to help with bronchodilation. And if it's not sufficient, but I'm still getting adequate fat loss out of it, which is going to be an hidden and added benefits of adding clenbuterol into my stack, I might consider 100, 200, maybe even 400 micrograms solbutamol in the form of a Ventolin inhaler on particular days like a quad or hamstring day where I need to get more air in. Again, I've only done one workout so far after recovering from the fluorona and yesterday when I did chest, I did notice that my lung capacity has diminished. So I'm going to use clenbuterol and perhaps solbutamol to optimize my lung capacity, allow myself to get enough oxygen in and expel enough CO2. I will continue to do this super deep breaths while I'm doing my daily fast cardio to expand my lungs back to my previous lung capacity. And our fingers crossed over the next couple of weeks or maybe even months, I'm able to restore the full functioning of my lungs. Again, not that I'm experiencing anything severe right now, but I do notice that my stamina and my overall lung capacity has diminished. So I'm trying to undo some of the damage that has been done by catching the infamous fluorona. I will add in 25 micrograms of T3. What I always notice is that when I do chronic caloric deficits for longer periods of time, because I don't do so much cardio, because simply I don't have time for it anymore, 30 minutes upon waking is all I have time for, and then walking in between sets when I'm at the gym, getting another 30 to 40 minutes of cardio in while I'm resting from my working sets. That's about as much cardio as I can afford myself. And adding in a little bit of thyroid medication, 25 micrograms T3 per day, spaced out over two servings, 12.5 micrograms upon waking before fasted cardio, and then another 12.5 micrograms sometime in the afternoon, two or three hours before the workouts. That is enough to keep my metabolism going, improve nutrient partitioning, not enough to get into a catabolic state. But of course, if I don't eat or don't eat on time, getting a decent amount of protein, healthy fats, fiber from vegetables, and perhaps a little bit of trace carbohydrates in every two and a half hours, then I might dig into my skeletal muscle and burn that away. So going on a low dose of thyroid, even though it's a replacement dose, getting to a little bit higher than super physiological levels, T3 holds me accountable so I don't miss any meals. And it's the same can be said for adding in the lantus, even though it's only 5 to 10 I use upon waking, which will certainly not turn you hypoglycemic. If you have lantus in the picture, elevated IGF-1 levels and elevated thyroid levels, the nutrient partitioning that you get out of that forces you to eat on time. So the last year or so that I haven't really taken bodybuilding 100% serious from a nutrition perspective, even though I've eaten clean, eaten all the bro foods that I needed to do, sometimes I would miss meals and then combine meals together simply because I was too focused on work. And I really want to go back to this old mentality where I eat on time and everything is super disciplined and I'm not slacking in the nutritional parts because the thyroid medication and the insulin is forcing me to eat on time. And again, I'm not saying that I ate like an asshole previously. I ate the right foods, the foods that my digestion agrees with, the super densely nutritious foods, but I would simply miss meals because I'm too focused on work. So that's why sometimes you see breaks in these videos nowadays because I'm eating on the clock, because I'm adding in the insulin and the thyroid medication. And to sustain androgen receptor sensitivity while taking anabolic androgenic steroids and improve fat loss further, by improving the rate at which the mitochondria can absorb medium and long chain triglycerides for energy production, 500 milligrams injectable carnitine subcutaneous once or twice per day, depending on when I do cardio or when I do my workout. So basically 500 milligrams injectable carnitine before activity. I do daily fasted cardio every day. So that's seven administrations in the morning and I do workouts five times per week. So that's another five administrations later in the day before my workouts. So that's a total of 500 to 1,000 milligrams injectable carnitine per day every day. This should help with my cognition levels as well. That's something that I've noticed by introducing injectable carnitine, that it acts as a very mild but noticeable 
nootropic because again, carnitine stores are not only present in skeletal muscle, but when you follow a ketogenic diet, whether you take oral carnitine L-tartrate or oral acetyl L-carnitine or injectable carnitine for that matter, this all helps with carnitine stores within the brain. And because you're predominantly burning fat for energy, it really seems to help with cognition as well. 500 to 1000 milligrams injectable carnitine on a daily basis. And I no longer take oral L-carnitine L-tartrates because I feel that this is the best way to go for me. I might add in the liraglutide right now. I'm My appetite is manageable. So at one point I might add back in the GLP-1 receptor agonist to control my appetite. Right now I'm getting enough appetite control from the modafinil 50 milligrams per day. And well, to be fair, I'm getting appetite management from Lantus. That's maybe uniquely to me. But I've not heard that from several of my clients as well. Even a low dose of long-acting insulin seem to keep appetite a little bit better in check. So take that from that what you will. At one point, I'm sure I'm going to get very, very hungry, at which point I'll add in 0.6 milligrams, maybe up to 1.2 milligrams of liraglutide upon waking to keep my appetite at bay. So I'm not focusing on thinking about food because I should be focused on my business, doing consultations and making videos for you guys. I might add in TB500 in BPC157. Right now, my knees are feeling a lot better than they did three or four months ago when I was training at my all-time strongest on the last cycle. Still, if my knees get any worse and mitigating some of the scar tissue in my glutes by switching to subcutaneous administrations and doing weekly deep tissue massage therapy sessions, still, if that's not enough to keep the knee pain at bay, I will reintroduce TB500 in BPC-157 at one milligram per kneecap per day. So that's TB500, one milligram on the left and right kneecap. And when I say kneecap, it's on the side of the kneecap. So these peptides can actually go into the kneecap and do all of their magic regarding the healing of connective tissue, not straight into the kneecap where the bone is. That would be silly and nobody should do that. Please eject it in the soft tissue so it can permeate and end up in the places where it should potentiate its healing effects. I might reintroduce GHK Copper for its sight enhancing effects, just because I still have a whole kit of GHK Copper sitting in the fridge. So when I do feel ready and my training intensity is at its all time highest, I might reintroduce GHK Copper five milligrams in the triceps and the teardrops to potentiate a little bit of localized sight growth. Already made a video about that. I'll link it at the end of this one. Regarding the ancillaries, 10 milligrams Zetamib to keep my cholesterol in range, 40 milligrams Telmisartan to help with my blood pressure and mitigate some of the negative effects that testosterone, methanolone, nandrolone, and oxandrolone might have on my renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system. And of course, estradiol plays a contributing role with that as well. So hopefully the Telmisartan can keep the water retention somewhat at bay. I might get additional water retention from the growth hormone and the insulin. Maybe the Telmisartan can help with that as well, but I'm mostly taking it to keep my blood pressure in range. I'm also taking five milligrams of Nabivolol per day to prevent further negative heart remodeling. Again, I'm already diagnosed with slight left ventricular hypertrophy and hopefully the Nabivolol and the Telmisartan for that matter, can prevent this left ventricular hypertrophy from progressing further. I do plan to do a yearly echo on my heart to see if the left ventricular hypertrophy progresses any further. So by the time this cycle completes, let's say next year, February, when the temperature gets too hot in Thailand again, and I want to come off cycle, and probably uh, trying for a kid with ACG and HMG monotherapy alternated, so I'm stocking those up as we speak. By the time I'm ready to come off cycle, I'll do another echo on my heart to see if the left ventricular hypertrophy has progressed further than where it was the last time I did an echo a couple months ago. I might at one point add in empagliflozin, which is a sodium glucose transporter type 2 inhibitor. So besides the effects that I get from telmosartan on the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, empagliflozin might modulate glucose and sodium excretion within the kidneys themselves. Now, there aren't really a lot of anecdotal reports on the combination of telmisartan with empagliflozin, so I guess I'm going to have to be the first, but I still want to see how I respond to this combination of telmisartan and growth hormone, the anabolic androgenic steroids and insulin together before I decide to add in the empagliflozin, if any, 
and see how that modulates my serum glucose concentrations and perhaps keeps the water retention that growth hormone can potentiate at bay. Again, stay tuned for that update. I'll let you guys know whether I add it in or not. It highly depends on how it responds to this anabolic androgenic steroid stack and the growth hormone and the insulin and the telmosartan on top of that. At this point, I don't really need 5-amino-1-MQ or cardarine for that sense to stimulate fat loss because I should be getting sufficient amounts of fat loss from the clenbuterol, the T3, the growth hormone, keeping my serum glucose levels favorable for continuous lipolysis by using long-acting insulin in the form of Lantus. Again, I've got the steroids in place, the daily fasted cardio in place, the activity in place, not missing any meals in place. So hopefully I'll have a very successful outcome during this cycle. Let me know your thoughts down below. Is it seem, does it seem way too complicated? Does it seem crazy? Are these dosages way too high? Voice your opinion in the comment section. I'd love to hear what your thoughts are. Thank you guys so much for watching. You can find everything that I'm associated with down below in the description section. Have a look at some of my sponsors and affiliates. Use the discount codes so you can save yourself some money while shopping online. Have a look at my latest article on my website, vigorousteve.com. The article is titled The Ultimate Control F Source List. Everything you could possibly need, things that I discussed on this YouTube channel, it's all listed in a single article. If you're looking for something specific, over-the-counter supplement XYZ, go to that article, type it in. You'll probably get a link and a discount code for it. And again, save yourself some money while shopping for that particular product. Follow me on Instagram and TikTok at Vigor Steve. Vigor Screw, you guys know what to do. A anabolic-induced front double bicep for you guys. The most complicated cycle you've ever seen, but low and effective dosages. Hopefully, fingers crossed, this will keep my health intact. So at one point, I can walk away from this crazy lifestyle unscathed. Until then, low and effective dosages, monthly blood work, keeping you guys updated, 100% transparency. And I think I'll leave it there. Thank you guys so much for watching. I'll see you guys in the next video.